good morning, hello and welcome to this service of Holy Communion provided by St Luke's Church in Hawkinge, Kent. And the good news is today that at 11 o'clock our church will be open for the first time in months for a special service of prayer and Holy Communion. All properly spaced and with all protections in place. If you can get along, do, but if not, please stay along and join me here as we celebrate Holy Communion together and we take a bit of a time out from our week to concentrate on the Lord and to give him the worship and the honour that's due. So let me begin simply by saying grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And let's sing our first hymn together Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. We say together now almighty god to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your holy spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through christ our lord amen our lord jesus christ said the first commandment is this Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, 
have mercy. Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me all that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St Paul says, this is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Let us therefore confess our sins in penitence and faith, and we say, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you, Rob. And of course, we'll be joining Rob a little later on as we celebrate Holy Communion together in the church. But right now, we're going to say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now we read today's collect. And today, as I'm sure you know, is the 13th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. Almighty God, who called your church to bear witness that you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself. Help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you, through him who was lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. And our readings for this week, the 13th Sunday after Trinity, we begin with our epistle, and it comes from St Paul's letter to the Romans, and we're going to read chapter 13, verse 8 to the end. That's Romans 13, 8 to the end. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whosoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our Gospel reading this week comes from the Gospel of St Matthew. And we're going to read chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. That's Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now it's time for us to sing again, after which we're going to go over to join Dave Williams, who'll be bringing us this week's message from the Word of God. Now, the hymn I've chosen is a new hymn, I believe, to the folk at St Luke's, but it's a lovely hymn nonetheless, and I hope it'll become a firm favourite of ours. It's called, We Come, O Christ, to You.
I'm pretty sure this isn't going to work online, but hands up everyone who thinks that up till now, 2020 has been a great year. Hmm, I thought so. Nobody put their hand up, did they? Well, on the 24th of November, 1992, the Queen gave a speech to mark the 40th anniversary of her becoming Queen. And in it, she referred to recent events as part of an annus horribilis. Now, for those who mercifully didn't have to endure Latin at school, it means a horrible year. It marks an end to a year in which the royal family had been beset by tabloid scandals and public splits. And just four days earlier, Windsor Castle, one of the Queen's main residences, had caught fire, suffering extensive damage. And the Queen said in a wonderful, understated way, 1992 is not a year in which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. Now, without wishing away the rest of the year, I guess 2020 will not be a year in which we look back with undiluted pleasure. But how will we look back at it? Let me read a very well-known verse. It's Romans 8 and verse 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now, we live in a world, don't we, that's dominated by sound bites, snappy slogans and memorable mission statements. And we can do Bible verses a disservice by thinking that's what they are, but they're not. And the so-called memorable verses are usually in the middle or at the end of a passage that climaxes with a particular verse. So Romans 8.28 has a context. And you don't need a degree in theology to know that the context is at least Romans chapter 8. So we're going to go back a few verses and have a bit of a run up to verse 28. And we're going to start at verse 26. For God's spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we're to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Now, Paul's been sharing about life through the Spirit. How do I know that? Well, most modern Bibles have useful section headings. And this is the heading in my Bible for the first part of chapter 8. It's a great chapter in a great book. And if you haven't read it recently, I'd encourage you to read the chapter. One of the many climaxes is this wonderful statement that by and through the Spirit, we're God's children. And as such, we're seen by God as heirs. And even more than that, we're joint or co-heirs with Christ. Now, God has given us so much in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's very much one of the key themes of Paul's many letters. But perhaps Ephesians most particularly, if you want to find out more. But then the verse carries on. And we learn that to discover the full glory of what it is to be a child of God and an heir, well, first of all, we have to share in Christ's suffering. And the link between sufferings and glory is an important piece of context for what is to follow. Now, I have a feeling that this is a bit of a man thing, but I do like finding the shortest route, particularly when driving. We've lived in Folkestone for over a year now, but I still get a bit confused in various parts of the town. And really, outside of Folkestone, I still don't have much of a clue. So discovering shortcuts, either through my own travels or somebody telling me, you know, it's far quicker if you go this way. Well, that's great. Now, there have been times when I've tried to do that with God. But I just can't find a shortcut to the wonders of what the Bible calls glory. Paul is really clear that we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. No shortcuts. And there's no shortcuts to resurrection life. You have to go through the cross. Now the Apostle Peter says something very similar in his first letter. This is what he writes. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, 
so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. I think we need to allow these words to speak to us in, in 2020. Let me read them again. Dear friend, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through in 2020, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Well, coming back to Romans 8, Paul then goes on in verse 18 to make this amazing statement. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, Paul was weighing things up. And I'm sorry, the digital scales that most of us have these days don't work in this illustration. You need a good old fashioned pair of balance weighing scales. So on one side, it's all the bad stuff that Paul is having to go through. And believe me, Paul went through a lot of bad stuff. Listen to this for a start. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In everything we do, we show that we're true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We've been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights and gone without food. Now that's the short version, the family friendly version if you like. If you want the longer version, you can pick it up later in 2 Corinthians in chapter 11 and verses 23 to 28. If you read this passage, you would never want to accept an invitation from Paul to go on mission with him. It never ends well, believe me. Now, Paul knew what he was talking about when he came to suffering. So that's on one side of the scales. But on the other side is the wonderful glory that's waiting for Paul and also that's building up inside of him. And his conclusion is that the glory side significantly outweighs the suffering side. The eternal reward, but also what God is doing in him in the present, well, it outweighs the present pain and the discomfort. Now, Paul spends the next few verses talking about this future glory. How do I know that? Well, again, it's there in the section heading, but they're useful. But for now, if we read on, there's a lot of groaning in the next few verses. And that's sometimes the only expression there is when we're suffering. In verse 22, the creation is groaning in its decaying state. Verse 23, we are also groaning as we experience suffering and pain and imperfection in our present mortal bodies. But I want you to notice that the groaning is not moaning. It's part of an indefinable but at times inexpressible hope that there is something better to come. And this is amazing. In verse 26 we discover that the Holy Spirit is also groaning and that he too is part of this suffering. But he's not restrained in the way that the, the creation is and our mortality is in that they can't fundamentally be changed, at least for now. But God's spirit can bring change and renewal, as it says that he intercedes for the saints. That's you and me, alive people, not dead people. He intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. That's verse 27. And now we come to verse 28. What's the context? It's suffering. It's bad stuff happening. It's things going wrong. It's circumstances we have not chosen. And all this happening when you're following God and walking in the Spirit. The context hasn't changed. We're not talking about those who drifted away from God or whose lives are increasingly disobedient or those who don't know God. These are God's precious children birthed by his spirit and living in and through the power of his spirit. We're groaning, but God is with us in our groaning. And in fact, he's groaning together with us by the spirit 
And so with all the suffering and, of course, the groaning, Paul writes. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. This is the climax. It's Paul's big statement and it's worth waiting for. Now, Paul starts off, we know. And I don't know about you, but I kind of want to ask, well, how does he know? There is so much we don't know. Paul's even confessed to this two verses previously when he says in verse 26, we don't know what we ought to pray for. And now he's claiming he knows about the ultimate workings of God and the reason why bad stuff happens. Well, we're imperfect. We're waiting for the imperfect to put on the perfect, for mortality to put on immortality. And until then, there will be stuff about God we do know and stuff we don't. But Paul was looking forward to the day when, in his word, he says we shall know God in the same way that he knows us. That's from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Well, Paul is able to confidently state this truth by faith about God, that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So let's unpack this verse. Well, first of all, we discover that God is in control. He's at work. Now, this isn't the same as saying that he's instigated everything. But in everything that happens, he is able to work God good. We'll come back to the word good in a minute. Now, the statement that God is in control and God is at work is not an easy statement. And we haven't got the time to deal with some of the issues that it can throw up. But Paul chooses not to deal with them. And on that basis, so will I. Now, the second thing is that although God includes all things, this statement does not include all people. Check it out. What God is doing is directed towards those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. So this is not a universal statement. It has specific application to those who love and follow God and whose path to glory includes present suffering. And then thirdly, we see that God is determined that this working for good will happen. Verse 28 refers to Christians as those who are called according to his purpose. We see that God is absolutely determined. This is his set purpose and his will for every believer. And this point's made even more forcefully when we look at verse 29 in a minute. So we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Okay, so here's the key question and everything rides on this. What's good? What does it mean? Well, in the English language, in itself, it's a word that it just means so many different things. We talk about good behaviour, where good could involve morality or ethics. But I, when I say that last night we had a good time, I'm certainly not commenting on the fact that everything we did was morally right or ethically sound, but of course it was, to be honest. It's a word that has a wide variety of meanings, and these are just a couple of the many meanings. So I can hear you shouting at me, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, we're almost there. But let me tell you first what it doesn't mean. Sorry, you've still got to wait a little longer, but it will do you good. There's another usage. It never sounds good, does it, when somebody says that to you? Now, so what does it not mean? Well, it's certainly not my definition of God, of, sorry, definition of good, which is, if I'm honest, about my likes, my preferences, my tastes, and so on. And it's not the Bible saying that, well, everything will work out okay in the end. You've only got to look around you just to know that that is not true. And also, it's not about some secret plan that God never reveals to us, but others come alongside and say, well, eventually you will discover why God allowed this or what he was wanting to do through it. Come on, wait over. What does it mean? 
Well, the answer's right there in the following verse. But for most people, Romans 8, 28 just exists in isolation. So, here's verse 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, that's in quite a loose translation called the New Living Translation, and I've been using that this week. But at times, if you like, the precision in language and meaning is sacrificed in places for overall readability. So let's look at something that is a more precise translation. Here's the same passage in what many of us use. It's the NIV or New International Version, or as some claim, the nearly infallible version. Not. Here it goes. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, whatever version we go for, the meaning is still the same. God has set a determined course for his people. He's not adapting as he goes along. He's not making it up. He's not changing course. He's not moving from plan A to plan B and so on. His purpose and his will for each of us is fixed. It's determined in his heart. If you like, it's set in divine, eternal concrete. And it is this, that we should become more and more like Jesus. That is the good that's being referred to in verse 28. There's no better thing that God wants. There's no greater work that God can do in our lives than to make us more like Jesus. This is the ultimate good in God's eyes. So, What's the point of 2020? This annus horribilis so far, and possibly there's more to come. As Boris Johnson said a few weeks ago, we're not out of the woods yet. No, Prime Minister, we certainly are not. The point of 2020 and the events we've been part of is that we would become more like Jesus. That's what verses 28 and 29 are saying. Now, we may not understand why things happen, and particularly why we suffer either directly on or indirectly. But let's allow God to do what he wants to do in us through our circumstances and experiences. That's to make our lives more like Jesus. Now, I want to tell you, it's not a quick process. Now, that's not easy for me, as I like things to happen quickly and now. It's a lifetime, and even then, there's still more that needs to be done. As we, think, as we see things in our lives that are not like Jesus, we can ask God to help us in those areas and make us more like Jesus. As we read the Bible and see for ourselves the life that Jesus lived and what he taught, we can come to God and ask him to make us more like Jesus. As we read how Paul, Peter, John and other New Testament writers talk about the Christian life, then again we can come to God in the areas that they highlight and ask God to make us more like Jesus. We've all gone through various forms of suffering in the last few months. We've suffered deprivation. Some have been very ill. Mentally and emotionally, many of us have been under great strain. And some have suffered loss of family or friend. Now God's desire and purpose for us is that through these things he has making us more like Jesus. There is no one more loved by the Father than Jesus the Son and there's no greater work than him making us more like him. He went the way of the cross where he prayed to his Father, not my will but yours be done. So let's come together and pray that prayer as a group of Christians, as a family, as people part of Lighthouse Church, other people listening in. Let's pray that prayer together now. Father, we just come before you at this time. You've heard our groaning. But Lord, we also want to say sorry for the times when we haven't just been groaning, we've been moaning. We ask your forgiveness for those moanings. We ask your forgiveness for 
perhaps some of the things that we shouldn't have done during the last few months that we have done. And we also come to you when perhaps we haven't always made the best use of the time that we've had. And we just want you to have your way in our lives. We pray that precious prayer, Lord Jesus, that you prayed to the Father. Not my will, but yours be done. And so we just give ourselves to you. We look to you to make us more like Jesus. We acknowledge that it's not something that we can do. It's impossible. But we ask that as we yield to you, that by your spirit you will, you will continue your work in us so that increasingly our lives become more and more like the one who we love and follow. We ask this for your glory and in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, it's time now for us to stand together and say the creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the law of the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. We just take a moment silence to pray for those we know have special needs and for members of our family who we are concerned for. Heavenly Father, we offer you our praise and thanksgiving because you are such a generous God, a God who loves and cherishes each one of us more than we can ever dream or imagine. A God who so loves us that you spare nothing that we might be saved and come into a living relationship with you. A relationship that exists not just in our heads, but in our hearts. We worship you who spared not his only begotten Son, that we might be forgiven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray against the spirit of fear that even now grips so many in our nation. Fear of COVID-19, fear of climate change, fear of accidentally speaking out of turn and causing somebody offence, an offence that might even cost us our jobs. Lord, we pray for all those who have lost their positions due to sharing your word and what it teaches with others. Strengthen and encourage them, we pray, and guide them into new employment, we ask. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our families at this time and our friends, that they may in due time come to see you and understand what a wonderful God you truly are. We pray for all those who are sick and afraid, lonely and who feel forgotten. Be with them, Father, we pray, and ask that you will draw them to you and grant them a touch of your loving kindness and mercy. We pray for our children and our grandchildren and ask that they may grow up in a world where you are honoured and worshipped. Protect them, we ask, in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And finally, we pray for our church family as we reopen this morning for a service of communion and prayer. We ask that all who are able to attend will truly encounter you and that new life will, like a river, begin flowing once more among us. Lord, revive your church right across this land, we pray. Forgive our sins and heal our land. We ask in the name of Jesus that you will do this and restore this country to what it should be in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together, Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we sing together again, and we're going to sing that favourite hymn, Amazing Grace. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. 
Father, we give you thanks and praise for your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you've created all things, who were sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revered the resurrection by rising to new life. And so he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and of wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took the bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And so far the calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, Rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. And as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us peace. It's now that you might want to take your bread and your wine to take for communion. Draw near with faith, receive firstly the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and then his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. After communion prayer. Almighty God, 
We thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, thank you, Rob, for leading us in communion this morning. We're now going to sing our final hymn together. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. With that we come to the end of our time together but before I go may I wish you all the Lord's richest blessing on your life in the week ahead and now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Well, I hope you'll want to join us again next time. Till then, God's richest blessing.